Well, we're starting a new series this week, Women and Scripture, Christianity and Women. I've been uh, reading this book by the Tibbles, uh, a Baptist couple I've known for many years, right since I first became a Christian. I met Diane and two of my children sat under her when they was in Sunday school. So she was a Sunday school teacher at the church I became a Christian at. And uh, Derek Tibble was a senior uh, Baptist man. He was, at the time, a principal of the London Bible College. Um, and those two got together. Uh, they've been in ministry together. Uh, Diane's a Baptist minister. And both of them, not on the same occasion, on different years, were presidents of the Baptist Union. And both of them write books. So uh, and I've always appreciated uh, Derek Tibbles, especially I've read more Derek Tibbles books than I have Diane's. But on this book, they, um, they concluded to write. They came out just about two years ago. So I thought it'd be a good thing to have a series on this, on this subject. Uh, and I'm quite looking forward. To where we go on this subject. So we begin with this verse, Galatians 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, says Paul. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to that promise. So the Tibbles say that this verse, especially verse 28, is the Magna Carta for humanity and for both men and women who are in Christ, are believers. So quite a, quite a important verse, this one, which I'm sure we all know and have read at some time or other. The tip will say this, there is unanimous agreement that this text means that men and women have equality before God as far as their salvation is concerned, just as Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, do men not have neither any superior standing in relation to God nor a different pathway to him all are justified by faith but there is and that's where agreement ends some say the quality of which the first speaks is limited to a personal spiritual state whereas the other side of the text inevitably has implications for a person's practical service in the church. So how do we explain this? This text seems quite black and white. Everybody's equal before God and therefore should be equal before each other. But we all know the world's not like that. England and the United States is, are often said to be two nations divided by a common language and a pond. In a like manner, those who accept the literal authority of the Bible fall into two camps, divided by the common text of Galatians. The meaning of this charter of liberty had sadly become a matter of dispute and the liberating vision of many and is in danger of getting lost in all the disagreement. We need to apply it for ever text that this is into the context. And the world in which Paul was writing was distinguished between Jews and Gentiles, masters and slaves, male and female. The first had to do with the cultural realm, the second with economic realm, and the third was all about sex and power. However, for the Christian, 
these distinctions should have no consequence to us Christians, says Paul. All would agree, says the Tibbals, that the gospel puts Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, males and females, on a living playing fields in their standings before God. None is in a privileged position vis-a-vis -vis others. None enjoys a superior status. None has special advantages. All must come to God in the same way, since faith in Christ is the only way to become his child. Women no longer receive a special, special status through their husbands, like Jewish believe, believers would have believed before Christ. So how do we and where are we going with this? Well, I want to start off with this statement. All are equal before God, but are all equal before man? So as I said, this teaching seems to make it clear that there shouldn't be any discrimination between male and female, men and women, employee or employer, or a person's ethnic colour, whatever. There shouldn't be any differences, either in the church or in society. Especially when you think that the Western world has grown up under this teaching for over 2,000 years now. Not quite so true within the Eastern and the Arab world. But over the centuries, you don't need to tell me this is not true. So we're looking and exploring all about this in the next few weeks. Women, employees, slaves, non-white races have had to battle against discrimination with any, without any help from Christians who should support Paul's teaching and not treat others differently. All forms of discrimination, whether ethnic discrimination or sexual discrimination, have been right over the centuries in the church. We see from the early church how many gentle slaves, strange enough, become leaders, but few women. It's a difficult to explain why. Although the text says all are equal in the spiritual sense, it doesn't even explain the later, because in, later on in Paul's letters, he doesn't seem to ram home this point in his other teaching, his other theology. And that's, I think, what gives rise to people not treating this verse seriously. Anyway, I'm researching all this. I've watched a great film this week. Never heard of it. It only came out about two years ago. It's the story, Ruth Baker Ginsburg the first woman female lawyer to sit as a justice on the Supreme Court. And she sat on that Supreme Court for over 20 years. And you may remember not so long ago when she died, just uh, about 18 months ago, and Donald Trump was at the end of his presidency. He went to great trouble to make sure that somebody like Ruth Baker Ginsburg wasn't appointed in replacement on the Supreme Court. So she was a great advocate uh, of non-discrimination in lots of ways, not just in the sexual field, in the ethnic field or the work field, but many other places. A great woman and a great story. I was hoping to you to bring you a, a, just a clip of this film uh, with a quote that um, I can't do that. I can't seem I can't seem to play it on um, Zoom. So I'll give you I'll send you the the link to where you might find this. But actually, I was astounded. I I downloaded this film on YouTube. And it only cost me two pound fifty, and I would say it's a good pound two pound fifty's worth of watching. 
and it tells the true story of how she came up through the ranks of the legal system to become the Chief Justice. Here's a clip. There are 178 laws that differentiate on the basis of sex. Women can work overtime. We have to get credit cards in our husband's name. We're not allowed to work in the something so This is amazing. You think you can change the country? You should look to her generation. They're taking to the streets. Protests are important, but changing the culture means nothing if the law doesn't change. What did you say your name was? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So, a great film, this. This, uh, this the early part where that film starts is in the late 50s. All right, so that's the, the time period. Where in when did you say women couldn't even have in America couldn't even have bank accounts in their own name? So here we go. She went to university. Um, she went to two universities and obtained two first class honours degrees, um, and came in her year group came top of each class. So she was a very clever woman. And uh, after she graduated and got a law degree, she was obviously looking for a job as a lawyer in a top firm in New York. And she had great difficulty. Uh, and this is the scene I was gonna show you. This is her 13th, they don't show you all the interviews, but this is her 13th interview to get a job in a top law firm in New York. So Mr. Green, who's interviewing her there, says, looking at her resume, that's her CV, wow, you created, you graduated top of your class. Reviewed in the law, Harvard Law Review and at Columbia too. I didn't know it was possible to, to achieve that. Ruth smiles. I worked hard, Mr. Green, all my life. Mr. Green wonders why. And he says to her, with your academic qualifications, Ruth, why aren't you applying for a larger firm than ours? And then he smiles. Oh, tell me, how many of you interviews have you been to? And they all turned you down, right? How many? Ruth Riley admits that 12 so far have turned her down already for a position. Green, fully aware of why Ruth has so far been denied a job, said, well, you're a woman, you're a mother, and you're a Jew to boot. I'm surprised that many of those top firms even let you through the front door. Ruth replied, well, when I apply for one of them, when I arrive for interview, they sent me to the typist pool. Another told me, it's no good employing somebody like me. I'll be too busy bringing up the kids. One person interviewed me and said, well, you'll be no good at this firm because we interview a lot of our clients in the locker rooms of the squash club. Another one said, it's no good having women lawyers. They're too emotional. And anyway, a woman like you who's graduated top of her class twice must be a real ball buster. She says, I've been asked some very strange questions. I was even asked when I was gonna have my next baby and whether or not I keep Shabbat. One interviewer had told me, I had a great CV, but they hired a woman last year. What in the world would they want two of us for? This is the sort of thing Ruth Baker Ginsburg came up against in her quest to become a lawyer. And in fact, for many years, she didn't succeed in that. And she only was able to teach law in a university. But she didn't give up hope and she kept on. And I would surprise, wouldn't be strange for me to say that you know, it is possible for women to get to the top, but it's enough more difficult than men. And this is a crime against humanity. No doubt about it in my eyes. But a great story. 
and really is relevant to our teaching here. So all are equal before God, but are all equal before man is the question I'm answering firstly this morning. Looking at that phrase in Galatians, Paul obviously taught only one distinction that mattered was whether a person, an individual, believed that Jesus Christ was the saviour of the world and wanted to be his disciple or not. That should be the only distinguishing things in our society. Some people say that this, what he was talking about here in this passage was just part of a baptismal teaching. And phrases like being clothed in Christ, being one in Christ, etc., are all frequent sayings in baptismal language of the time. And Paul's not really saying that men, women are not to be different from men because obviously physically they are. The other thing we have to remember, of course, is that within Jewish society, sex discrimination was ingrained. Jewish men had a regular prayer which said, bless me that you didn't make me a Gentile. Bless me, bless you that you didn't make me a slave. And bless me that you didn't make me a woman. That was part of the liturgy of the Jewish church at the time of Christ. And this is what Paul is seeking to battle against as he teaches these godly principles of what Chris, how Christians should teach, treat each other. Scott McKnight says, Paul's main thesis is that the Galatians are sons of God and heirs by faith in Christ. He then restates his point by saying that all who were baptised have put on Christ. And Paul was most concerned with the word all, which becomes obvious by his explanation in verse 28. In Christ, there are no racial, social or sexual distinctions because all are one. The implications of the allness of verses 26 to 8 is brought out in verse 29. Those who belong to Christ are both the seed of Abraham and his heirs. So he goes on to say that we need to observe that Paul was taking notice of the historical context of Jewish society and Roman society when he wrote this letter. And he's clearly teaching that women and men, slaves and free, etc., and race, ethnic people, shouldn't be treated differently and that's why he quotes that Paul will, would have been well aware outside the Jewish world he wasn't a person who just knew Jewish culture he was a person that knew Greco-Roman culture as well and of course there was a widespread conviction there that women were inferior and we've even got it in Jewish history the historian Josephus wrote says that women are different from men and inferior, and that's what the Jewish law maintains. So we move on. This is an interesting thing that uh, many of the commentators bring up when we realize that um, Christians don't off always follow the words and advice of Jesus or Paul. Let's take this verses from John's Gospel. This is a Jesus in the upper room. After Jesus has washed their feet, he put on his outer garments, back on, and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I have just done to you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and that is right, you do so. Because that is what I am. I am Lord and teacher. I have washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example for you 
so that you will do just what I have done for you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are never greater than their masters and messengers are never greater than the one who sent them. So what McKnight and other commentators saying is this is a well-known act of Jesus to show his humility, that he was the leader, he was God, and yet he was willing to wash people's feet, which in his time was regarded a slave's job to wash feet. But do we wash each other's feet in today's society? We don't. We claim that, of course, well, that was just, you know, that was the time when uh, everybody wore sandals and the roads weren't tarmacked or paved and uh, therefore people's feet did get washed, did get dirty and needed washing often. And so it's that sort of thing's not relevant to Christians today. There are only one or two churches, I would suggest, that go through this act of feet washing, and that may be only once a year on uh, Monday, Thursday. It's not something that's carried over, is it? Because we think, well, that's a time, does it really affect us now? Do we really need to wash each other's feet? Well, it's not the point, of course. Jesus is saying it's an act of humility. And so we treat that passage as if it's out of date. And we treat the passage in Galatians 3 out of date as well. It doesn't really cover our situation. And this is what we're up against these days. But we, of course, realise that social structures in the first century are not what they are now. But it doesn't mean to say that this verse in Galatians should be put on the back burner at all. That's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that we, as failed human beings, often do not follow the teaching of Scripture. And this is why we have this today. We're quite content, the males, I have to say, to believe and think that we're really in charge of the world in charge of our families and in charge of our companies. So let's go back a bit to the beginning, to the situation about us all being created in the image of God. So I want us just to go back to a few verses at the beginning of Genesis at the creation of the world. When God, I want you to look out for where in these next verses, we're going to hear how God created man and woman equally. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it I give every green plant for food. And it was so. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. 
and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So creation is entirely the work of God, his own handiwork. And men and women he made in his own image and likeness. Whatever else this phrase means, it conveys the sense that humans are born to relate to God and as his image, to reflect his image into his world. Image in this sense means that we replicate God as he is into his world. Although we do not do so in all respects since we are not creators nor are we like him physically. It's generally thought that the word likeness was in the text to help clarify this and remove any understanding that humans are not exact copies of God and have his deity or his creating ability. But we're created in his image in his likeness. Therefore, the meaning of made in God's image, besides placing humanity in a class all of its own over all the other creatures, means God's image is seen in us, but not in him. God charges us with increasing our number, filling the earth and subduing the earth as his reps, representatives and looking after it and taking care of it, bringing order to it. So what's important for this study is that within the whole of the text of Genesis, we see that God creates man and women equally. He does shelve out the differences of responsibility of ruling, of ruling but he entrusts the whole of his creation to both Adam and Eve. So that doesn't help us, but what we can read is the creation of woman from Adam's rib wasn't anything to do with giving him superiority over the woman. Of course, this description of God creating woman from Adam's rib is always cause humour and I suppose always leads to demeaning jokes and demeaning women, which is not good. But creation stories do give rise to people demeaning women because God chose to create men first and many will say well women were created as a spare part as an afterthought look god gave adam the responsibility of uh, naming the animals eve wasn't created then but we can't read into that situation that that was because god thought adam was always going to be superior to eve no we read Genesis in the whole, men and, were, got, men and women were created equally, but differently. I always like uh, Matthew Henry's commentary here. I mean, Matthew Henry, Henry was the first uh, theologian to produce a commentary 
as in the modern way back in the 17th century. And uh, I expect many of you have heard of him and uh, his commentaries are freely available on the, on the World Wide Web these days. And he says about this, the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be loved. And I think that's a very true description of it. I think he's got it 100% right, Matthew Henry. The Tibbles say that when Adam awakes from his deep sleep and first sets his eyes on Eve, he does not see her as a rival, but as a partner. This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, he says. In other words, this person I see before me is someone other than me, somewhat different from me, and recognisable as the same as me. It's not the anatomical difference, but the essential relatedness between the man and the woman that is emphasised in Adam's response to seeing Eve for the first time. It cannot be suggested, so the Tibbles, that Genesis suggests a hierarchical relationship by between man and woman in any way, which I think is important for us to realise. Just quickly, then, because time is going on, and I'm pressing the wrong button. Women and the fall of humanity. I just want to make this uh, point. Was the last one this morning. Without any introduction, of course, the fall of humanity comes with a snake appearing before Eve, who engages her in conversation. And of course, we all know the outcome of that. He tempts her to eat the fruit of the tree she shouldn't eat, <coughs> and sin enters the world. We may want to speculate why the snake was chosen as the chose Eve as the tempter. But all that the Genesis account says is that Genesis points to the craftiness and the deceptive ability of the creature, the snake. And he certainly, the snake certainly deceives Eve and encourages her to eat the fruit. But where is Adam? Adam is at her side. He's aware of the conversation. He's in the presence of all that is happening. And he never says anything or doesn't object to Eve of taking the apple. So they were equal in sinning. There's nothing to say that you can bl man can blame Eve for bringing sin into the world. Eve may have made the first fateful decision and take up the apple, but Adam is fully complicit in her decision and he does nothing to resist that. And of course, what happens as soon as they gain wisdom through eating this apple, they realize that it's less, their nakedness is an embarrassment to each other. And so they cover themselves up and then they start telling lies when they meet with God about what they've been up to and where they've been. This one instant, we all know, changes everything. Both Adam and Eve's relationship with God is broken down and they're expelled from the garden and life is no longer easy or pleasurable. It comes with its difficulties. Difficulties for Eve and both for Adam. To blame only Eve for the situation is not credible. Adam stood by and watched and that sin wasn't an isolated one. One sin, of course, led to the others. So Genesis 3, just because of Adam and Eve's actions, reverses the intentions of God's creation purposes for humankind. So history testifies that the ideal created relationship is corrupted from this point on. And although men and women are capable of living in harmoniously together in marriage 
and having beautiful, long-lasting relationships. History testifies that many marriage relationships and family relationships between male and female members are broken down. And uh, within it comes male bullying, arrogance and hostility and physical and mental abuse against women. That was never God's intention. It was never God's plan. But it was something happened when sin entered the world. So next week, we're going to look at the whole situation of women under the old covenant. <laughs>